my wife has a master's degree uh, in, in philosophy and her main area is in bioethics, medical ethics. Um, so she, you know, did her residency in a hospital and, and did the sort of, or the ex in a, a experience uh, in, in a hospital anyway. And um, so she's read a lot of uh, the things that you've written on or reflected on. She was very excited. I got to talk to you. Um, and, uh, but it, it may be helpful to go, I mean, this is basically created in the nineties, right. As a sort of a, a discipline or a field, but what's it really getting at? Um, you know, uh, why do people study bioethics or medical ethics? And um, so if you just want to take that and run with it, wherever you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, I would trace the history of bioethics earlier to the fifties and sixties. Um, there's different ways of telling the story, but one, one way of doing it is to say that at the point where going to the doctor or the hospital was more likely to save you than kill you, new kinds of questions are raised. And that has to do with the introduction of um, antibiotics. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, uh, what is it? Septic or aseptic? Aseptic means of doing um, surgery. And so, you know, for the longest time, if you went to the hospital, you, you, it, you, you know, it was maybe 50-50 chance that the, the treatment would uh, help or hinder your mm -hmm. recovery. Um, so certain kinds of technologies, among them antibiotics, uh, also when iron lungs were developed and you had a limited resource now that had to be distributed in some kind of fair way, and there just aren't enough to go around. And so when you have the ability to extend life, when you have limited resources, you have to allocate in a fair way. And then the other big thing is like Nazi war crimes and the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. These kinds of things started getting people thinking about human rights and research ethics and so forth. So there's a bunch of stuff that's coming onto the table, but what was going on in moral philosophy in the 1950s, I mean, you were talking about um, the kind of logical positivism that was affecting psychology, but also philosophy where, you know, in order for a term uh, in language to be meaningful, it had to be verifiable. Mm -hmm. Moral claims were seen as not the sort of thing that you could verify. If I say something's wrong, one view is I'm basically saying, I don't like that thing or boo that thing. And yet when you started to have questions of like Nazi atrocities and you have questions of who should get the limited resource and you have questions of uh, how shall we decide who lives and who dies, the, this view in philosophy, which treated moral questions as kind of just emotional expressions rather than things that had weighty, definitive, metaphysically rich answers, wasn't really cutting it. And so the people who were taking these questions seriously were really theologians at the time who were mm -hmm. willing to make claims about right and wrong. And so bioethics sort of developed out of this world where there were practical decisions that had to be made about life and death. There were also weighty moral considerations that didn't feel uh, properly accommodated by the kind of boo yay theory of, of morality coming out of moral philosophy. And so, you know, one well known strand of this is uh, Beecham and Childress got together and did some sort of national committee with uh, a bunch of other bioethicists and theologians and philosophers. And their whole point was can we figure out a way of talking about moral questions using what's come to be described as mid level principles? And so the idea here is if we say that we're going to come up with a moral answer, premised on you being a utilitarian, then the only people who are going to agree with that moral analysis are going to be other utilitarians. And if somebody's coming from a religious or theological perspective, they're not going to be agree with that outcome uh, uh, of the moral analysis, potentially. And so is there a way of saying, regardless of your, your uh, kind of high level meta-ethical view, where you, what you think grounds these mid-level moral principles, what are some principles that we kind of agree on across these different meta-ethical traditions? So if you're you know, a, a theologian is going to be interested in something like this idea of respect for persons, and maybe they'll ground it because they think we're all God's children or something like that. But, mm -hmm. you know, other deontological views can ground the notion of respect for persons, even without necessarily appealing to a theological framework. You know, all these different views will say that all else being equal, it's better to cause benefit than to cause harm. So, okay, maybe you can, regardless of your meta-ethical view, you can ground some sort of, you know, beneficence principle. Um, and then there's various ways of adjudicating about what it means for, for justice or fairness to, to play out in a given situation. And that's the sort of thing that you could, you could agree on at, at, at some abstract level should be part of what we care about when we're making these practical decisions. So if I could summarize some of the stuff I've just kind of blurted out, I haven't studied the history of bioethics in, in any detail. And so this, this is all a bit sketchy. Mm -hmm. 
But basically, uh, you know, these questions arise earlier in the 1990s. Maybe what you're talking about is the formalization of bioethics as a discipline. We start mm -hmm. to see like master's programs in bioethics. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe that comes around in the 90s or so. But um, people are doing bioethics and something recognizably like what's happening now from, from around the point where practical life and death decisions had to be made with medicine that had to do with new technologies that fundamentally changed the choice matrix matrices that uh, doctors and policymakers and patients and families face. And then also just an attempt to try to talk to each other across net ethical frameworks about serious moral considerations without just collapsing into boo and yay type language, but saying it's wrong what the Nazis did. And that was something that bioethicists were interested in. So it, it's one of those, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, that's good for filling in some of my um, ignorance on this. That, but it, you know, there's that glib um, hashtag that went around uh, uh, first world problems, you know, which is always about these sort of trite things. But it actually really is an indication that what was really happening in the 20th century was changing the kinds of problems that were happening in the developed world. Um, and uh, now we see in the developing world, because, you know, the developed world is established now and is, you know, sort of is what it is, that it raises these questions uh, of, of ethics in a way that are really, again, I, I always come back to Aristotle, I'm going to eventually grow out of this, but, you know, I'm just fresh out of it. So what are you going to do, right? Um, that really are questions of proportionate, proportional justice. How do you allocate resources to where they're supposed to go in a way that's the most fitting to the place that they're going, um, you know? If, if you need an organ transplant, should it go to the 19-year-old healthy person or the 85-year-old unhealthy person? Um, and uh, that's really, I mean, that's, I think that's a quintessential kind of caricature question. They're usually much more serious and don't usually fall in that kind of disparity. But it's those kinds of questions, right, that bioethics is trying to wrestle with. Yeah, I mean, there. So, for example, when there when kidney dialysis became possible, and there were you know limited uh, resources for who was going to have access to this treatment, some, somebody had to get together and decide. And so, what would happen is at hospitals, you would have yeah maybe a chaplain and somebody from the community and a doctor, and they just sort of try to figure out what they thought was fair, but on what grounds? What you know is their opinion about what's fair more valid in some objective moral sense than some other committee's opinion about what's fair? Right. Or are we just agreeing procedurally that whatever the committee comes up with just is what's fair uh, in this context? And so the, the, this, this prompted the need, obviously, for stepping back and asking, how, how, yeah, how do we decide what's fair? What does fairness mean? What is it consistent? How does it play out in different contexts? What are the different dimensions of fairness? Proportionality seems like one of them. Uh, and, uh, you know, equal opportunity seems like one of them. And so these, these are the sorts of things that got people, you know, uh, turned on in, in bioethics because they were urgent questions that had life and death consequences and that it wasn't enough to just sort of say anything goes or, well, whatever that committee decided, I guess is fine because how do we know that that's a legitimate committee for making moral de decision-making? You know, mm -hmm. on, on, on what grounds are they passing judgment on this matter?